Hi friends! Thanks so much for joining me for the February episode of Craft and Thrift podcast. Um, if you're new here, I am Amy. I'm the owner and founder of Craft and Thrift, which is a sustainable fabric shop you can find over on Etsy. Um, I'll be putting all the links in the description below. I sell exclusively vintage, thrifted and dead stock fabric, so everything in the shop is essentially secondhand. And the idea is that I source those pieces and curate them to make it easier for you to shop secondhand for your sewing practice at home. I'm obviously here on YouTube. Uh, I'm also on Instagram, so again, I'll pop the links below. Um, and in this podcast, every month I'll be discussing sewing, sustainability, small biz, and there'll be a self or a personal update as well. So thanks so much for tuning in and let's get cracking. In the sewing section this month, um, I've got two projects to talk to you about. Uh, this cardigan and a pair of chinos. Um, I thought I'd start with this cardigan, mostly because I'm wearing it, so it's easy. Um, this I made in the last couple of weeks, actually, and I've, I've had a lot of wear out of it since I've finished it, which is always a good sign. It's a fabric that I got in a job lot for the Etsy shop. Um, I don't think there's enough left over to list it, unfortunately, um, which is a bit of a shame when I go to all the hassle of making something kind of with the view to being able to promote the fabric and then pick something where there isn't actually enough left to be able to promote the fabric. So that's excellent marketing there from Amy. But I really liked this colour, to be honest. It's a kind of mild um, shades of blue. Um, so it goes with loads of things in my wardrobe, which is nice. Um, I'm not quite sure what the fibre is, because obviously the nature of buying fabric secondhand is that it, it never comes with a label. So I think just from the feel and the burn test, it's a polyester sweatshirting. Um, it's that kind of jersey, um, sort of fleecy backing, um, and then that smooth um, sweatshirt material on the on the front. Um, it's quite sweaty, which is a bit of a shame because I'm a bit of a sweaty Betty. I think I've mentioned that before. Um, so if I do basically anything that in exerts any energy at all, um, I end up really sweaty in this. So this is definitely a kind of lounging around the flat sort of um, cardigan rather than a sort of actively walking into town kind of cardigan. Um, and actually I'm wearing it with a Lou box top um, after last month's episode. But yeah, so I've got a lot of wear out of it so far. Um, it is a, I've got the pattern here. Um, it's a stuff and still pattern, which my best friend Victoria um, de-stashed to me. So thanks Victoria, if you're watching, love you. Um, it's stuff and still, I've never really uh, sewn with them before um, and they give them super catchy names. So this is 25013-1. Uh, in the size small. Uh, it's designed for stretch fabrics, I don't know if you can see that with the reflection from the light. Stretch fabrics, and it's marked as easy, which we'll, we'll get onto later in this chat. Um, it comes with a, a long length and a short length. I made the short length. Um, and it also comes with a, um, a sweater version as well. I haven't made the sweater version yet, um, but it looks like it would be quite simple. It's, it's a sleeveless sweater, which I don't know how useful a sleeveless sweater would be in my wardrobe, um, but I think from the design of the sleeve head there, it'd be fairly easy to just add the sleeves from the cardigan onto the onto the sweater. Um, but yeah, I'd quite like to try that. I would say I've never sewn with stuff and still patterns before, so forgive me if I'm telling you something you know already. Um, but they, they did slightly confuse me. Um, two things. So I've got the pattern pieces out here to show you. Um, so it doesn't come with your traditional kind of pattern sheet with all the the um, the line pattern pieces drawn out. Um, it comes with them already pre-cut out for you on this sort of um, that kind of hybrid paper fabric type material. Um, the stuff that you could rip, um, but I'm obviously not going to. Um, and it's already got everything marked on. So you can probably see there that like the notches are marked on. Um, these little marks I realised were for um, where you would cut the pattern piece if you wanted to, to get kind of longer or shorter lengths. I just folded it up because I, I might want to make the longer length next time. 
I should say I made the short leg this time um, and it's not massively short on me but I'm only five foot so if you were a, a non-hobbit size it probably would be shorter I'm gonna try and insert some video later on of me wearing it like standing up wearing it so you can see the whole thing um, yeah but I found this slightly confusing because I was expecting your kind of traditional paper you know you fold out the pattern pieces and then you trace around the ones you want or you cut out the ones you want um, no this came already cut out which in some ways is nice it's like a time saving um, approach I guess because you can just literally whack that straight on your your fabric without having to do anything um, the downside is, and I realise this now, this is marked as a size small, so it goes small to extra large, so not massively inclusive sizing, um, but the um, there's only four sizes, and if you wanted all four, you would have to buy four versions of the pattern, so you're only getting one size in the pattern, um, like, pamphlet envelope. Um, which is a bit of a shame because for something like this, which is quite loose and unfitted, I would make this kind of thing for like my mum or my gran as a present because um, you wouldn't have to worry too much about it not fitting. Um, but obviously it only comes with one size in the packet. So my mum and my gran don't wear the same size as me. So I can't now make this again for, I could make this again for someone who wears the same size as me, but not for anyone else. Um, so that's a bit of a shame, I think. Um, Having said that, I've looked these up on Stoff and Still's website as much as I could. I wanted to link to this specific pattern and I can't find it on their website. Um, so I don't know if that's because the, the system, the website, I didn't find the easiest to navigate um, or if maybe this one's out of print, I'm not sure. Um, like I say, I've got it from a friend, so I didn't actually buy it. Um, but uh, yeah, so the downside was that you would have to buy all four versions if you wanted Four different sizes um, so yeah that's a bit of a shame um, the other thing that I found quite tricky um, was let me show you the instructions da, 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 da. so you get just to give you an idea so you get four pages which in of itself I'm already like where's the rest of it because I guess being used to using indie pattern indie patterns where you get like almost a booklet of instructions it's like this was quite scant I thought um one of them is just the uh size chart um so actually uh on the double xl which is the size this goes up to uh goes up to a where is it 122 centimeter hip um or a size 22 which isn't massively inclusive these days um Having said that, sorry, I've just realised I never finished my point from earlier. When I tried to look this up on the website and I couldn't find it, I noticed that most stop and still patterns are only like five or six quid. So I guess to a certain extent, you kind of get what you pay for, you know, for five quid, when you think an indie pattern is like 15 quid, but then you might get, I don't even know, like a double XS right up to a triple XL or whatever. So you get a whole range of sizes. For this, it's only a fraction of the price but you're only getting one size so I guess swings and roundabouts there um so yeah one of our four pages is blank on one side and it's just the measuring chart um <clears throat> one of the four is um it's like Ikea instructions one of the four is in the same instructions but in different languages so helpful if you want multiple versions in different languages but not particularly helpful for me then you've got your the bit that goes on the front that obviously shows you the, the pattern itself um, and then your cutting layout on the back and then when you get to the actual instructions this is what you're looking at um, so it's not a huge amount if I'm honest from what I'm used to I guess I don't really sew that much with big four um, and my understanding of big four is that the pattern instructions are a lot more scanty compared to indie patterns so maybe this is if you're used to sewing big four patterns, maybe you'd be more used to this. But um, but yeah, the the actual written instructions come down to one side of what is essentially A5 when you, because the other side of that is blank. Um, and then you get three diagrams um, that show you uh, how to do the front panels because the, the two front panels, and I quite liked this construction. So these two front panels actually come together at the back seam and that back seam then becomes like the um, like the first part of 
the actual back of the sweater as well. I quite liked that. I've not I've not come across that before, so I quite enjoyed that. Um, there's also a diagram of how to attach the sleeves. Um, and how to do the bottom hem, albeit I did not understand how to do the bottom hem at all, so I did it the way I've done for other cardies instead. So this this was marked easy, and I feel like it would be it was easy enough for me as an intermediate sewer who's already sewn a couple of different styles of this kind of cardigan. So I would say this is not that dissimilar to the grain line driftless, except the driftless has pockets. Um, or the Seamwork Oslo was the other one that I thought was quite similar with the kind of shawl neck. This one kind of wants to stand up the shawl neck, whereas the Seamwork Oslo you kind of fold down. But if you folded this one down, the um, this seam would be on display, so you don't want to do that. So yeah, so this one's more like a shawl neck, I guess. But yeah, so I've made a couple of styles of cardigan like this before, so it, this didn't phase me too much that the instructions were so brief. Um, but even with that, I struggled with the instructions for the bottom hem and basically just made it up myself. Um, so I don't know if I would put this down as easy. I know easy is somewhat objective, isn't it? Because easy for me as an intermediate sewer might not be easy for someone else who this might be their first attempt at sewing something. So I'm not a massive fan of that skills like kind of rating, if I'm honest. Um, but I think things like beginner, intermediate, advanced are more like um, objective in a way. Um, I think it does have a five star rating. Of course, I've just thrown all the paper on the floor, so we'll never know. Um, I think there is a five star rating on the back, but it's quite small and hidden away. So it's not necessarily that obvious. So if you were just picking it up off the shelf, you would see easy and think, ugh, jobs are good and we'll get that one. Um, but if it was the first time you'd ever sewed something, you, you wouldn't find this particularly easy, I wouldn't say. So yeah, bit of a mixed bag. I will probably make this again, if I'm honest, because it's quite a versatile pattern for me. And I can imagine making it in lots of different colors and it came together really quickly. Um, so from that point of view, I'll probably make this again. Um, there are some small adjustments I, I would make. So for example, when you attach this um, kind of collar band to the main body, doesn't have you top stitch this seam. And I personally think it needs it because it wants to kind of flip out. Um, so I actually, because I'm lazy, I haven't gone back and done that yet, but I, I will at some point. Um, I like that you can make it in different lengths, so depending on how cropped or not you want it. And because there aren't pockets, it does make it easier to adjust the length. But I would also say the lack of pockets is kind of a bummer. <laughs> um, and from that point of view, I'd probably be more inclined to make the grain line driftless again, because the pockets are super handy. So... I don't know, swings and roundabouts. It's a nice one for me to have in my stash and I'll definitely make again, but I don't know if I would be recommending it. So yeah, take from that what you will. <laughs> For my second sewing project this month, I wanted to share a pair of trousers. So I'm not wearing them, I've got them here so I can show you some of the details up close and then I'm going to change up the um, video setting and I'm going to show this cardi and these trousers on so you can see them kind of in action. Um, but I wanted to show you these up close because sitting down you're not going to see much of them. Um, I'm really proud of these. <laughs> They're a bit of a mixed bag. They don't fit hugely well, um, so I'll probably be making them again, um, possibly using a different pattern. Um, but this, these are the Alina Design Co. Chi Town Chinos, um, and it's the second time I've made this pattern. I made it last year in a kind of polyester it was supposed to be a wearable toile, um, but they ended up being so sweaty, they were just like unwearable. Um, and they were too low at the back, so I ended up with like a builder's bum every time I bent down. Um, but they were a good like practice run. Um, and I quite enjoyed making them. There are some parts of this pattern that I don't know if I would want to make it again. Um, so for example, it doesn't have a waistband, it has a facing, so you... Um, instead of attaching a separate waistband, you basically fold the this section down and then sew it in place. So it kind of creates like the illusion of a waistband without 
actually having a separate waistband piece. Um, and I'm not massively keen on that construction, having made it twice now. I think a separate waistband looks nicer. Um, but having said that, I made a lot of adjustments to this pattern, so I don't know how much of that is just the adjustments that I've made versus the actual pattern, if that makes sense. So what I probably need to do is make this pattern again um, and actually follow the instructions and not make adjustments. Um, but I would need to make some minor adjustments because the aforementioned builder's bum, so we'll see. But if we start from scratch, so this is the Alina Designs Co. Uh, Chi Town Chinos, um, and I made them in this beautiful um, corduroy that I bought dead stock from Roberta Cummings on Instagram. I'll put the links below. Um, I'm actually about to buy a job lot of fabric from Roberta in the next couple of months, so watch out for that coming. She doesn't have any more of the brown cord, but she's got some really beautiful mustard cord, so that'll be coming to the shop shortly. Um, I can't remember what size I made. I will look it up and put it in the in the corner here. Um, but the first version I made, I thought were too low. Um, so yeah, there was the builder's bum. Um, but also, like they they are designed to be kind of worn like low slung on your hips. Um, and I don't know, that's just not really a style that does it for me anymore. Um, so I knew I wanted to increase the rise, um, but I wanted them more like high rise, high waisted. So I added two inches to the rise, which is a lot. And in retrospect, I slightly regret that choice. I probably, if I did it again, I'd probably go with maybe an inch and see what that felt like. But as an experiment, I really enjoyed doing it because I worked it all out myself. Um, so I, I looked at the pattern pieces and I worked out what would need increased by two inches. Um, and then I, I added that to all of the relevant pattern pieces, or at least I thought I did. Um, I missed off the back pockets. I didn't add the two inches to the back pockets. Um, so the back pockets are actually two inches too short. And the only reason I get away with that is because the facing, um, when you fold the facing down, it just catches the top of the pockets. Otherwise they would just be flapping about in the breeze. Um, so it's more by luck than judgment that that worked, but it worked. So whatever I learned. Um, it's got back welt pockets. So again, delighted with these. I've only made welt pockets a couple of times, um, but uh, they are, if I undo the button, na 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 na, functional pockets, whoop whoop. Um, so that's exciting. Um, and they're quite deep actually. They almost could do with being deeper for holding a phone, but um, but they they mostly work. So that's good from a phone point of view. Um, at the front, we've got slash pockets. Uh, there we go, put my hand in there. Um, again with um, nice lining um, and again I think this is partly where I went wrong because the slash pockets um, are designed to go you might be able to see the um, they go all the way up to the facing and then you fold the facing down and stitch it in place so you're kind of catching the top of the pocket and stopping that first couple of inches being functional which is fine like that's obviously how it's designed to be but it means you go from having quite a nice deep pocket to kind of losing a couple of inches which is a bit of a shame um and again with a waistband I feel like you get a truer sense of the size of the pocket because the size of the pocket is the size of the pocket and then the waistband gets added on top of that rather than making this enormous pocket that you think wow that's going to be so good and then you have to fold down and stitch over half of it don't know maybe just me being picky um there's a button at the front which I'm actually going to change this to a red button I didn't have a red button at the time I made these so I just whapped this black button on so I could wear them um, but I'm going to change that to a red button in time so it matches the one on the back um, and then it's got a zipper and fly um, again I don't know if I like this is just because I I've kind of made a bit of a mess of this but you you insert the, the zip and it goes all the way up to the top and then you fold the facing down and you stitch so this from this point to the top here is the zip showing but it's not actually functional and that, I don't know if I've made a mistake there or if that's how it's supposed to be. So you put the button on kind of over the zip and the button buttons up, but the zip only goes up to the line of stitching. So you're kind of losing like an inch of zip, which I, I don't know. I just think that looks weird. Um, and then inside I chose to do the bias finish for the bottom of the facing. And I think that looks really smart. It's just bias binding that I had in my stash. It's nothing special. Um, and I used one of my um, Stitch Collective uh, fuck sizes. Um, 
labels there. I actually cut it in half because I made these while I was at my grand's um, and I only had one of these so there's half in here and half in the back of my cardigan um, which is why it's fraying a bit at the bottom. They don't normally do that but that's because I cut it in half. And then inside we've got this amazing horse print um, fabric which I used to make a deer and doe melio, melio? melio shirt um, and this is the remnant. So I've actually I cut out a loo box top, unsurprisingly, out of this and then the remnants I've used for my pocket linings. I really like how that works, how that looks, sorry. Um, and then at the bottom, ba -ba -ba -ba, we have little turnips. And I did the, I, I surged all the insides with um, red and yellow um, thread. I don't have red and yellow overlocker thread, so I just used regular stuff and I just used, you know, the little plastic doodad that goes on the spindle to hold the cone of thread in place. If you take that off and turn it upside down, you can use it as a cap to hold a smaller spool of thread. So that's what I did. Um, and then it means you just get this little peak of red on the outside, which I think looks really cute. Uh, so yeah, overall, I am pleased with these and I will wear them. I'm, I'm slightly annoyed that they don't fit as well as I'd like. So despite making three twirls, so I made one twirl and then I made three sets of adjustments to it. Those adjustments don't seem to have translated to my fashion fabric the way I'd intended. And this is an ongoing issue for me with twirling that, uh, you know, you make your twirl and you spend the time and you make your adjustments, but your twirl material is never going to be exactly the same as your fashion fabric material. I guess unless you make a twirl in your fashion fabric, but then what's the point of making a twirl? Um, so the problem I find is making those adjust adjustments in like a, a heavy muslin, for example, but then trying to kind of anticipate how those changes might translate into your fashion fabric which might be heavier or have a stretch percentage or whatever um so with these they came out too big around the waist um which is annoying so i took in i took two little darts in in this place here to um try and like bring the waist in a little bit and then i covered the darts with the belt loops so you can't really see them um and it does it does bring in the waist a bit um and I, my plan is to wear them with a belt anyway but it's just a bit frustrating when you go through that whole process of twirling and then it it doesn't work the way you want to um so i don't know i don't know how much use i'm gonna get out of these they're a bit granddad and like not kind of chic granddad like um just like old man granddad do you know um so yeah i don't know they're fine for like pottering in the house walking the dogs they're the kind of trousers i'd probably wear in the garden in the future um but i don't know if i'd want to like wear them to london to visit friends do you know so which is a shame because i've I've put quite a lot of effort into them. Um, but I've learned a lot, so, you know, it's it's never wasted time. It's just a little bit sad when you don't quite get what you're looking for at the end of it. sustainability section this month I wanted to talk about produce bags so these have been popping up in shops around me I don't know if you have them in in supermarkets near you um, but a lot of supermarkets offer these now instead of those little plastic um, single-use see-through bags that you would put like mushrooms and onions and things in um, so our local supermarket is a Sainsbury's um, and I think to be fair Sainsbury's are quite good at sort of marketing those sustainability switches and they have a lot of like RSPCA approved meat and um, a lot of vegan options and things like that which is nice um, but they've started offering these produce bags in the vegetable and fruit sections so rather than buying your loose veg um, which obviously cuts down on plastic 
um, packaging, which is amazing, but then putting it all into a single use plastic bag. So is that any better kind of thing to bring it home? Um, you can now buy these in store. Um, they're not expensive. They're only like 30p or something like that. So to be fair, I have a mix of like bought and handmade ones um, because sometimes you just don't have time or energy to make absolutely everything <laughs> in your life. Um, but I wanted to flag these because I have actually made a few of these. So these two I have made. Um, and again, I think they're quite easy sustainability switches that a lot of us could make. And it's another good use of like your cotton or like your light viscose or whatever um, scraps. So, you know, once you've cut out your top or your lining or whatever, um, any scraps left over, you could cobble together and just make it's a very simple drawstring bag. Um, so this one, for example, this one's quite large because I, I actually use this one for bread because um, our local um, Scott Mid has a breadwinner bakery, which I don't know if that's a chain up here, if that's a chain everywhere, um, but it's a, a bakery anyway. And they do these really nice like sourdough loaves and things like that. Um, but again, you, you put the bread into, it is a paper bag, but then it's got that clear plastic panel in it. Um, so you can see the product through it. And I don't know if that's recyclable because then it's a mix of like paper and plastic. So I try really hard not to take a bag and I try to put it in one of these instead. So that's the added benefit of making your own produce bags is that oftentimes when you buy these in shops, they do come in kind of one size. And I think it's the size that they assume you're going to want to put, yeah, like onions or mushrooms or whatever in. Um, but if you're buying something like a loaf of bread, you might actually need a bigger one than, than the general size you're going to be able to buy in the supermarket. Um, but yeah, this is just a really basic drawstring bag. So I think for most people with any kind of sewing um, skills under their belt will be able to make this. Um, and even, you know, your newbie sewists, it's quite an easy first project. Um, it's basically just a rectangle. Um, this one, I didn't even sew round all three sides. I just cut a rectangle, folded it in half. So this, this seam here, sorry, cover my face. Um, this seam here is actually a fold. It's not a seam. Um, and then I've sewn around the bottom and the side here. Um, and then I just folded over the top. I actually overlocked the edge to stop all the edges to stop it fraying. Um, but I overlocked the edge and then I folded it down once and sewed it in place to make the channel. Um, and then I took just a piece of cord. I'm not even sure where this came from. I think I might have rescued this from a pair of pajamas or something like that. Um, and I just fed that through the channel to create the drawstring part. Um, and then I just tied a knot in the end so that when they go through the wash, it doesn't all unravel. Um, so that's the size that I use for mostly for, for bread. Um, and then this one is the kind of smaller size that I use for like, yeah, onions and potatoes and things like that. And this actually came from Ikea. So this, uh, well, via the charity shop. So I bought an Ikea net curtain in a charity shop um, for I think three quid. And it's enormous. I mean, it must be like a couple of meters long by maybe a meter and a half wide and so far I think I've only made two produce bags from it so I've got this massive roll of netting just sitting in my stash and at some point I'll knock up a few more of these um but I just brought it home washed it put it through the washing machine and then again I've I made this on my overlocker so if you didn't have an overlocker um, you'd want to zigzag the edge to make sure it doesn't fray or maybe if you're feeling very fancy you could practice your French seams um, and then I just threaded a bit of cord so I think I had this in my stash for making piping at one point or other so it is quite big and fast which the downside is obviously the weight of this gets added to the weight of whatever you're buying so you would obviously fill it full of your mushrooms, put it on the scales, and then the, the machine will tell you how much it costs. So you don't want to use anything too heavy for either the cord or the fabric, um, because then you're just going to get charged for the bag. Um, but honestly, like, I, I mean, I, I don't know how much the machine charges me for using these, but I don't think it's much. I've not noticed a massive jump in price in the price of my onions or whatever um, since I've been using my own produce bags. So yeah I just feel like it's another one of those easy sustainability switches like you know if you're ever sewing with like like cotton cotton lawn um, even like a viscose or a polyester so long as you can wash it regularly that's the main thing and so long as it's lightweight material um obviously if you can see through it that might make your life easier it depends on 
um, you know, when you go through the checkout, like I've never had an issue with it, mostly because I do self checkout. I just plop it on and tell the machine what's in it. Um, but I guess if you were going through a person checkout and it was a bag like this where they can't see, they're going to need to open the bag to see what's in it. Um, or you maybe just don't drawstring it, just leave it open on the on the um, conveyor belt. They can see what's in it and then you can drawstring it and pop it in your bag at the other end. Um, I also use these for storing um, fruit and veg in. So I've got one that just permanently lives in my kitchen hanging up with garlic in it. Um, and I've got another one like this that I use when I bake bread um, at home. I use it for storing that. So I put it in here and then I put it in a bread bin. Um, so it's got kind of two layers of, of protection from the air. Um, so yeah, it's this nice, easy. This one I think is like a not actually even sure what this is. I think maybe like a cotton muslin or something like this. I've actually thought it would be good um, to use up your twelve fabric as well. So like I just used this kind of fabric for the twelve for the chinos that were earlier in this video. Um, and now that I've made the chinos, I'm debating whether or not it's worth keeping that twelve. It might be because I might make that pattern again in the future. Um, but if I decide against it, I'll just cut it up and make it into bags and actually the, the legs I was thinking they've already got a seam on either side I could just cut a chunk out the leg sew up the bottom and put a drawstring in the top and then like it's already halfway done do you know um and I could probably get easily two bags out of each leg maybe three bags out of each leg um so yeah drawstring bags little produce bags nice easy switch out um to take to the supermarket another way to avoid taking single-use plastic bags um, and also really good if you shop anywhere that's got a refilling station so um, again my local Scott Med has just introduced this refilling station so you can take your own um, produce bags or um, like mason jars or Tupperware whatever um, and fill it with your own like lentils or whatever they do broken cashews that are much cheaper than buying whole cashews um, so I use these in those kind of stations as well but yeah, nice easy project, would definitely recommend. small business section um, this month I wanted to have a little chat about why I chose Etsy. I always find these bits a little bit awkward when there isn't a prop in my hand you know for the sewing and the sustainability sections I've generally got something in my hands um, but I don't know about you but as soon as I'm in front of the camera I'm just like what do I do what do I do with my hands and my face and why am I so weird and awkward <laughs> um, so I kind of thought having knitting in my hands might help so we'll see if it provides a distraction uh, I might just end up putting it away um, but yeah I thought for the small business section this month because we're sort of starting from scratch in a way like last month we talked about um, kind of the history of craft and thrift and and my history selling online and how I came to set up craft and thrift um, this month I thought I would go into a little bit more detail of why I chose Etsy so this is just my personal experience, so um, if you're looking to set up your own shop, um, don't take my word as gospel, obviously make sure to do um, your own research. Um, and if I'm honest, um, do as I say and not as I do, because I did not do my own research, so I went with Etsy mostly because it was the one that I was aware of at the time. Um, I don't know in retrospect if the others were as big, I remember, because this would when I first started selling on Etsy was during vet school, which was what, 2008 to 2012. So it was probably like 2009, something like that. And I'm not quite sure what the options were on the market at the time, but I don't remember Shopify being around, for example. Um, I remember the kind of two main options that I was aware of was Etsy and Folksy, um, which I don't even know if Fo Folksy is still going, to be honest. but. At the time, Etsy was kind of somewhat in its infancy, I think, um, but it was still fairly well like marketed, so it was the one that I was aware of, um, and I used to buy stuff occasionally on Etsy, so it was it was a platform that I was sort of fairly familiar with, um, and from that point of view, I think if you're setting up a shop, you know, 
that's not to be sniffed at the fact that it's an app that you're already kind of aware of and you feel comfortable using as a customer means that when you come to set up your own shop you have a better idea of what it's going to be like using it as a customer and therefore what you might want to offer as as a shop owner sort of thing um so like you know the little notes that you can add into the um to the checkout process for example or how to um how to pick your shipping profiles these things are all made easier if it's a platform that you've bought from yourself so you have some experience of as a customer um so from that point of view i felt quite comfortable using etsy they also make it quite easy so for setting up a shop it, it's it's a very kind of um like foolproof system they kind of guide you through the whole thing um, and there's a lot of help available like they, they have a seller handbook for example um, that has a lot of how-to guides in it and sort of best practice guides um, and the Etsy forum is enormous and there's basically any question that you've ever thought of has probably already been answered. Um, the downside of the forum I find is that it is sometimes like overwhelming <laughs> you go and you google it and, and you, especially if you're not quite sure what question you know what the problem you're having is but you don't necessarily know how to ans ask that question so you have to ask it in like multiple different formats to find the answer you need and then each time you have to wade through like dozens of answers to find the one that that best fits your issue um but you know that's kind of a con the pro of that is that generally somebody somewhere has answered your question already which is quite nice um i've never had to contact the actual help people like the the folk who are there um as customer service for etsy sellers um but i do see that they're very active on instagram so i i, I follow a few of their sort of official etsy um accounts on instagram um and that they seem very active um at answering people's questions on instagram so i would like to think from that point of view that they would be fairly on it if you had a um an in-person like a, a, a question about your shop so yeah from that point of view I feel like with Etsy there's a lot of help and support available um, and yeah it's a fairly easy to use format which if you've used as a customer um, is kind of even easier to navigate um, it's very like drag and drop style in how to set up your shop so every time you make a listing for example it's very kind of drag and drop in terms of like uploading pictures and there's like boxes available for like your title and your um, description so it kind of guides you through everything that you should be putting into your listing anyway you don't need to think of that stuff from scratch um, and then there's a lot of optional extras when you're doing your listing so you can list various like attributes or variations for your product um, and you can kind of toggle them on and off depending on whether or not it's appropriate to offer them um, which is quite useful so you're not if it was there permanently for every listing you might be doing a lot of like not applicable not applicable not applicable but you can kind of toggle on and off whether or not it's that attribute is shown to a customer which is quite good um, the downside I think of that sort of drag and drop style um, setup is it's great in the early days when you're a beginner and you just kind of need your hand held. Um, once you've been selling on Etsy for a little bit of time, I do think there's not, it's not very flexible for kind of um, personalizing it for yourself. Um, so I think I talked about this a little bit in the last video that I've often found the shipping profiles section to be not massively flexible. Um, like in an ideal world, I would quite like to be able to build shipping profiles based around weight. So the more you order, potentially the more you pay for shipping, um, maybe up to a point where you would have it capped sort of thing. But um, but you can't really do that. So there isn't a way to like assign a weight to every um to every object so that when somebody's like adding multiple things to their checkout basket it adds on the shipping automatically um, so it's either you've got to set the shipping very high with the assumption that somebody might order five kilos of fabric and then you've covered your base and then refund back to people anything they've paid over the odds which is fine but is a little bit faffy and it potentially puts people off ordering because if they see extremely high um, shipping price and they're only ordering like two cuts of fabric um, that's the kind of thing that might put them off 
ordering even if it says that you'll refund the the shipping overages back to them um you know that still might put people off and surprising number of people do not read the listing so i have so much info in the description so much info in my faqs and i still almost daily get messages asking for info that is literally in the description so it'll be like hi what's the stretch percentage on this and i'll be like as stated in the listing it is xyz um or there's, I get a lot of questions about um, about shipping, um, which I find quite frustrating because it's all in the FAQ and I've spent a lot of time crafting my FAQs specifically to avoid having to answer the same questions over and over again. Um, and like, I don't mind taking the time to answer questions if people are genuinely confused, but a lot of the questions I get asked are from people who just haven't bothered to read, they haven't looked they haven't even tried to find the info themselves, they've just gone straight to asking the question. And I find that a little bit frustrating because I'm a little bit like, I've spent a lot of time investing in my FAQs to save me time in the future of not having to answer the same question over and over again. And by you just kind of firing off a quick message to me, you're kind of implying that your time is worth more than my time. Um, so maybe just take, you know, a minute or two to check the FAQs if the, your answer is, if your question is answered, then great. If it's not, then feel free to come back to me. Um, and I actually now have started putting that in the bottom of every listing because um, because it is it's just so frustrating. <laughs> Side note. Um, but yeah, so I think in some ways Etsy is great in that it's it's quite straightforward. It's very kind of drag and drop. It's very beginner friendly. But I think once you've been selling online for a while and you want something maybe a little bit more um, advanced or a little bit more customizable, um, you kind of hit a bit of a wall with Etsy. So I'm sort of starting to think about setting up my own website. So I actually have a website, which I'll link below. Um, it's just a very basic like three page um, site that just basically amalgamates all of my links in one place with a little bit of sort of about me um, and I mostly set it up so that I could get personalized email so um, my email address is linked to the website so it's hello at craftandthrift.co.uk um, so it looks quite professional it's not like a gmail account or whatever um, so I quite liked that so that when I'm reaching out to people to do collaborations or to ask about buying job lots of fabric I kind of look like a legit business you know um, but the plus side with my website is that I, I host it through Squarespace and there is the option to add your own kind of e-commerce site to it. So that is something that I'm vaguely thinking in the future of maybe branching into um, with the thought being that there'll be more flexibility to customise it the way that I want to um, for things like shipping profiles, for example. Um, but also... They'll, it'll be a lot cheaper. So I need to look into this properly. I assume Squarespace would take some percentage off me um, for every transaction done. But Etsy at the moment, all the fees add up to about 30% of the, it's just under, it's about 28% um, of the sales that I make. So every month, if I make a thousand pounds in revenue, like just under 300 quid of that just goes straight to Etsy. Um, and that's quite a lot. <laughs> I mean, like that's a significant chunk and like I get it, Etsy should obviously make money, um, they're providing a service, um, but there's a transaction fee on everything. So on the shipping, they charge a fee on that, they charge VAT, they charge a transaction fee on the actual transaction itself, they charge for you to list it as well. Um, so that's like four different charges before, without even really thinking too hard about it. Um, so yeah, it all adds up and it's hard then not to look at that and think, well, if I did my own web hosting, I wouldn't have to pay, I imagine, half as much of that. The downside, obviously, of doing your own web hosting is the footfall. And I think this is where Etsy is good, that like it's a large, well-established brand that people are aware of. Um, and people like just Joe Blogs on the street is aware of, you know, not just like people in the creative crafting world. Um, they market well, so they obviously had a TV ad over Christmas, for example, um, and they have a podcast, and they have YouTube, and they have Instagram, so they're, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they market themselves really well. Um, so from that point of view, they bring a lot of footfall that I don't think my own website would, would get initially. That's obviously the kind of thing that builds up over time. 
So I'm kind of toying with the idea that potentially in the future I might run both alongside each other, so have an Etsy shop and a website. Um, so I had this recently with, I bought some yarn from a website called Knitted Home, I think. I'll put it, I'll put the link below. It's actually for this scarf. Um, and I initially bought off their Etsy, that's how I found them first. Um, but then when I got the order through, it came with a postcard with 10% off if I made my next purchase through their website. So I actually, I did go back to buy more yarn from them and I went to their website to do it, to use this voucher code. And I thought, that's clever, that's canny. Like they're clearly doing that to drive footfall to their own website that they wouldn't necessarily get if you just Googled. Because if I, I was looking for um, Drops um, Silk Mohair, the yarn that I used for this. Um, and when you Google that, I mean like thousands of shops come up. So I don't know at what point in the Google search knitted home would come up depends on their like search engine optimization i guess like their keywords and whatnot but um but yeah they're probably a lot lower in the rankings there than they would be somewhere like etsy and especially if you've been selling on etsy for a while you've obviously got that big customer base and the positive feedback and the thousands of sales it makes you look legit and makes people trust you when when they want to buy from you but if you can then over time gradually redirect them to your own website jobs are good and kind of thing so that's kind of what i'm thinking i mean this would be a longer term goal probably like three to five years um i'd need to learn a lot about setting up an e-commerce shop um but yeah that's kind of vaguely where i'm thinking of going in the longer run but at the moment etsy serves me fine like there's definitely some downsides but it does the job, so I can't complain. Um, and yeah, just something to kind of think about for the future of the business really is where where we'll be going in the next five years. So for this month's self section, I've got two things I want to share, um, a scarf knitting project that I've been working on um, and a book that I've been listening to. I thought we'd start with a scarf because there was obviously a scarf earlier in the video um, and you might have some questions about it. Um, it's actually the second version of this scarf that I've been working on. So the first version is this one, um, which if you're a newsletter subscriber, you'll have probably already seen um, in the newsletter. Um, this is the stash, stash bust scarf pattern um, from Summerly Knits. Um, I'll link everything below. Um, it's a free pattern that you can get through her Ravelry um, group um, or I don't know if she offers it anywhere else because a lot of people aren't using Ravelry at the moment but I got it off Ravelry um, and the idea is that it's designed to like it says on the tin as a stash bust so the idea is that for most of us who knit you end up with all of these like odds and ends of yarn hanging around um, and it can be hard to know what to do with them. Um, a lot of people sew them into, or knit them, sorry, into shawls, um, like the, you know, your triangular or whatever, that rough shape um, shawl, um, and then wear them either as a shawl around the shoulders or as a scarf. Um, but I've never really been into that style. It just, I don't know, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, so I was always at a bit of a loss with these little odds and ends. Um, but um pattern which i have here um it actually specifically talks about how it opens up with her basically saying the same thing that she doesn't really like uh, shawls so that's what led her to design this um this pattern so yeah it's the stash dive scarf by summer lee design co um and she starts with saying um the stash dive scarf was created to solve problems i love it um I needed something to keep my neck warm on cold winter walks, but I'm not a shawl person. I was like, sign me up, lady. We seem like we'd be friends. Um, I printed this whole booklet, but honestly, if you've if you've been knitting for a while and you can knit in the round, you probably don't need all... Most of these instructions are irrelevant. Um, there was one section that I found quite useful, which was how to avoid a jog when you change colours, which I've always struggled with and never knew how to deal with that um, and now I do so that's a bonus um, and then she gives you a rough idea of um, I mean the instructions are quite brief because 
I mean, for most of us, you wouldn't necessarily need that in-depth set of instructions. I think even as a beginner, if you can knit, as in do the knit um, stitch, um, and you can work in the round, then like you can you can make this. It's it would be a really simple beginner pattern. Um, it she even gives you like a little schedule of like depending on how many uh, stripes per day you sew uh, you knit how quickly it's going to take you, which I thought was quite cool. Um, so yeah, it was designed to use up kind of sock remnants. So it, you in the pattern I think she talks about holding a, a strand of worsted and a strand of fingering fingering um together to create one yarn um and then knitting with that um i don't actually use those weights very often um so i aimed for a kind of more dk weight um and just basically combined my fabrics um oh my god i'm unlike sewing mode um my yarns to get the same weight of yarn in each stripe so that you're not having one stripe much thicker or thinner than the other um so I aimed for a roughly DK, maybe slightly heavier um, weight of yarn. Um, and some of these, so like this light green, I just knit the green by itself with a strand of mohair. Um, but the, I'm trying to think, uh, this brown one, I held two strands of brown and a strand of mohair together. So I kind of, I alternated how many strands of yarn I held together to get roughly similar weight of yarn in each stripe um, because if it's not clear if you're not sure what I'm talking about if you do say thicker thicker for the navy and then thinner yarn for the mustard the navy would be a wider yarn uh, uh, your wider stripe and then it would go into a thinner mustard um, because the the each stitch for the thicker yarn is going to be bigger like wider stitch so you end up with a, a scarf that goes kind of like this which maybe that's what you're looking for, but I wanted something more uniform. Um, so yeah, I aimed for a roughly DK weight with every um, stripe, and I think it's come out fine for that. Um, so for all that the instructions do say, hold worsted and fingering together, I don't think you need to be necessarily that strict about it. Um, I also, I wasn't 100% sure how well all of these colors would go together. These were just ones that I happened to have in my stash. Um, so I chose to hold a strand of mohair throughout so I just chose um I think it's chalk is the shade of drop silk um mohair um I'll link below where I got it from um and I think that kind of it offers this like white marl um color throughout um and I think it just kind of ties it together so where some of these colors might not naturally go together I think holding that mohair throughout just just kind of brings it all together makes it a bit more cohesive um and because it's in the round, you end up with essentially a tube, um, which you then, when you block it, um, becomes a flat, double-sided scarf. Um, so it's double thickness, double-sided, uh, which makes it super cosy and warm. Um, I'm not going to lie, I kind of love this scarf. I've worn it loads. I wasn't particularly sure how well these colours would go with my wardrobe. I kind of made this because I wanted something dead simple to knit and not necessarily because I wanted the final object. I don't know if anyone else does that, where for me, knitting is as much about, it's almost like meditative, you know? It's almost, it's as it's much about doing the action as it is about ending up with the product at the end of it. Obviously, if at the end of it, I end up with something to wear, then so much the better. Um, but if I don't, it's not the end of the world. I knitted a hat not long after this and it looked ridiculous. So I just put it in the charity bag like it was totally fine in the way it's made um like it's a good quality well-made hat it just didn't suit me so just popped it in the charity and I, I felt a brief moment of like oh that was a waste of time and then I was like you know what it, it kind of wasn't like the, the yarn was in my stash the mohair was just a scrap left over from this um and it you know, killed a couple of evenings of watching TV and just allows me that like meditative flow state. Um, so from that point of view, it's it's not wasted time, do you know? And if, if a charity gets to make a fiver or whatever off selling it, then so much the better. But yeah, so I made this one for me and I've worn it loads already this winter. So I'm delighted with this one. Um, and because it was such a good stash bust, I realized I had enough scraps left over to make a second one. Um, so I'm actually making this one for my brother um, who his birthday is in April, but he lives in Italy. So um, I need to get it done probably in the next 
couple of weeks to get it parceled off and sent away um, to be sure that it'll arrive on time. Um, and I'm actually not far off. I've probably got two or three more stripes to do and then that'll be finished. Um, and I actually, it's kind of embarrassing, um, I realised that this colour green from this scarf and this darker colour green uh, also from this scarf and then I have a third colour of green and some cream and I thought ooh like three different shades of green and cream would be a really nice combo so I'm thinking I'm going to go back to Knitted Home and I'm going to buy three balls of the mohair in they've got like a sage green colourway that I think would tie all that nicely together um, and I might make that one again for me <laughs> because you can never have too many scarves and I kind of figure I live in Scotland it's chilly a lot of the year even in the height of summer it'll be chilly first thing in the morning or last thing at night so I mean I wear a scarf basically the whole year round there's probably two or three months of the year where a scarf is not useful um so time spent knitting a scarf is never time wasted and at the moment my other knitting project which I'll probably show you guys folks next month is a quite involved like cable vintage pattern that does require a lot of thinking um, and I don't know about any of you but I my brain is not capable of doing much thinking at the moment so this striped scarf is like the perfect kind of brainless tv in the evening kind of project so I don't mind doing a third one two for me and one for my brother that's fine <laughs> worst case scenario I could gift this one to my gran maybe and then at the end of it, once I'm done, I blocked this one and I'll do the same for Danny's one in this Daughter of a Shepherd um, soap wool, wool wash bar. Um, so it's like a block of soap, um, but it's specifically for washing your wool. Um, and it's really cute. The way it comes packaged is really adorable. So I was actually thinking what I'd quite like to do maybe for the March episode is I'm going to film myself... Um, blocking probably this scarf um and show it as the clippies the little um like bits between uh, blocks so in this episode you've seen i think snowdrops and dogs playing and things in the march episode i think you'll probably see some clippies of me blocking this scarf um because this wool wash bar is really it's really sweet the way it looks and it smells lovely um and it leaves your wool smelling it's almost like grass which is nice like mown grass so yes, that is my knitting project that I've been working on for most of February um, and into March. And uh, next up is a book. So the second part of the self section, I wanted to talk about a book that I listened to this month. Um, I listened to it on Audible, um, but this is a book that you can get anywhere. So I know last month I recommended a podcast that you can only get on Audible, so that was great. Um, but this is a book that you could buy from any bookshop um, or obviously listen to it online like I did. Um, it is Becoming by Michelle Obama um, and it came out I think a couple of years ago um, and I was quite interested in it at the time but it is a big fat hardback book <laughs> and at the time I was like I, I really want to read that because I find the Obamas quite interesting um, and I don't really know much about American politics and, and that would be quite an interesting kind of introduction to it I guess um, but this yeah this was a big fat book and it kind of put me off slightly because I don't tend to read as in like I read um non-fiction um I tend to read books before bed or in the bath and it tends to be escapism it's like fiction books um non-fiction I find really interesting but I I have to listen to it because it's kind of more like an extended podcast I guess in that way so I often listen to books while I'm packing orders, for example, or driving in the car. Um, and I eventually bought it on Audible um, and it is fascinating and I would definitely recommend. Um, it was a good one for me because I think like many white people in the last year, I've kind of realised how little I know about racism. And that's obviously my privilege being white, um, that it's not really something I've ever had to face on a day-to-day -day basis. So I've been trying to actively educate myself about 
racism and and issues around that um and to that end I, i'm reading an anti-racism book um and i follow um a few podcasts um but one of the things that they talk about in this anti-racism book that i'll talk about in a later episode is um how you want to educate yourself about racist issues but you should also celebrate the positive attributes of um any culture or society and it shouldn't all be focusing on learning about the 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 hardships and the downsides obviously those are really important um but we should also be celebrating um kind of successes and positive stories and happy news kind of thing um and i thought michelle obama's story would be a really interesting one from that point of view because she comes from quite a working class background and obviously she's ended up you know first lady of the um United States of America um but along the way you know she earned a lot of accolades herself you know she she's a lawyer in her own right and as the first lady she instigated a lot of very positive policy changes and programs aimed at um uh childhood nutrition and um education of women and young girls and especially people of color um and supporting military families um so she's you know obviously she is the wife of Barack Obama and he was the, the president um but you know she's she's a, a well respected um and accomplished person in her own right and I found her um because the, the book is narrated by her as well which is I think I think that's really nice as an autobiography to hear it in their own words kind of and their own voice um so I'm quite because I was thinking afterwards like I they she talks about how they met um Nelson Mandela um, towards the end of his life and I'd quite like to read his autobiography um, so I was going to look it up on on uh, Audible but I suspect it probably won't be read by him because um, I don't know I, I I would need to look into that but I don't know how whether it'd be weird to like listen to an autobiography that's not um, uh, spoken in that person's voice anyway sidetrack um but yeah so michelle obama she talks about starts kind of with her childhood and a lot about her family um like her her parents were both working class and her dad was disabled so and obviously they were a black family living in in america so you know she's overcome a lot of hurdles um and her family sacrificed a lot to make sure that she got good education and um and she had the opportunities that she's had um but equally you know she's a hard worker and has made the most of those opportunities and um i don't know that just her work ethic i i i really respected throughout the way that she talks about her work and her life's meaning and and her goals and accomplishments so really that really resonated with me i think as a similarly minded kind of goal orientated person I was like wow Michelle we we could be pals <laughs> um so yeah it was just really fascinating and some of the facts like just the behind the scenes of the day-to-day -day life of being the first family like there's one section where she describes about the presidential motorcade and I didn't realize this but like the president's motorcade includes obviously it's like bulletproof glass and it's bomb proof and but it also includes um like a unit of the president's blood like or blood type so that i guess if he was shot or in an explosion like the 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 doctors could administer his blood right there and then at the side of the road um he always travels with a personal physician as well like a doctor um in his motorcade um and the the uh, motorcade is um nuclear proof uh chemical weapons proof biological weapons proof like it's kind of bonkers like you you see pictures of it on the news or on video i i don't know i didn't it looks impressive in terms of like the size of the cars and the sheer number of them but now i know more about the behind the scenes of like the technology that's in those cars as well i'm like wow that's that's really impressive you know there's always a helicopter on standby wherever he is um and there's always like armed like i guess like sniper rifle people i'm not sure what you'd call them um as well and it all kind of logically makes sense but when you hear it kind of described in a paragraph like it, it's just it sounds so bonkers um yeah 
Um, she talks a lot about being a mother in in the White House as well, and and I don't have kids, and I, I don't have a huge interest in ever having them. So from that point of view, um, when she got onto the mother bit, I was a bit like, ugh, rolls eyes. This tends to be the bit where I tend to to kind of glaze over. Um, but I actually found it really interesting, like talking about how she trying to balance being a mother in the White House and, and being a mother to young children who are obviously going to school and trying to live their lives and trying to have sleepovers with friends and go out for ice cream and the kind of logistical problems that that, um, that, that created for, because the kids obviously had their own security details so they couldn't just like spontaneously jump in their friend's mum's car and, and go to the mall kind of thing like you know all that stuff has to be like organised in advance and cleared with with um, security and whatnot. not um, and it, it just it makes you realise how many hidden obstacles you have to overcome you know it's it's obviously this incredible privilege to be the first family but it's like a gilded cage in a way like it comes with a lot of downsides that you know Barack Obama obviously made those choices when he ran for president and to a certain extent I guess Michelle made those choices by supporting him but her kids didn't make those choices do you know like they've just kind of got dragged along for the ride and and I imagine it's opened a lot of doors to them that they wouldn't have had access to otherwise, but equally it's probably closed a lot of doors. There's probably a lot of things that they can't do um, or won't have been able to do the way that sort of normal kids will be able to like, you know, walk around the corner to their pal's house. Like there's no way they could have done that or pop to the shop to buy sweets or a magazine. Like that's just not the kind of upbringing that they would have had. Um, and in some ways that's sad, you know, but but then I imagine the privilege and the opportunity far outweighs that. So it was interesting. Um, lot She talks a lot about the racism that they, as a family and she as an individual, encountered. But it's it's done, it's kind of peppered throughout the book. So it almost kind of takes you by surprise because it's not a book about racism. So she'll be kind of talking about, you know, something seemingly unrelated and then like drop in an anecdote about about the racist element that they had to overcome and it kind of takes you by surprise and in, in some ways obviously that's my white privilege showing that that's not something I would have ever had to think about in those kind of circumstances had I been Michelle Obama do you know um and it obviously it, it was quite shocking and quite saddening that even in those incredible spaces that Michelle has had access to she was still coming across sexism and racism um it just makes you realise how ingrained it is in like every level of our society. Um, there were plenty of bits where it brought a genuine tear to my eye. I was like choked up <laughs> listening like, oh, Michelle, pass me a hanky. Um, there's a bit where she goes to an underprivileged school in London um, and she meets with them and, and does a talk with them. And I think she later on goes back to that same school and speaks at their graduation or their like high school leaving um, thing. And um, there were then there was then a study that showed that the the graduating class that interacted with Michelle Obama went on to achieve higher grades and more university entrances than than had ever previously happened in that school. Um, and like imagine having that kind of power. That's amazing. Like all those young women's lives that she's touched and they specifically chose the school because it was um, women of color as well. So like teenagers. Who, from like Muslim backgrounds and um, and other people of colour who would have so many more hurdles to overcome in accessing education. Um, and just like, how incredible is that? That like, you know, all these young women's lives have been touched by Michelle Obama in a way that will hopefully benefit them for years to come. Um, I'm getting a tear in my eye just thinking about it. Um, so yeah, overall, really enjoyed it. Uh, would definitely listen again and would definitely recommend. Thanks so much for joining me on this February episode. Um, <laughs> As last month as well, this has come out a couple of months in a couple of weeks into March. Um, so hopefully by the end of March, I'll have all my technical difficulties and whatnot smoothed out. But thanks for sticking with me. Um, 
I hope you enjoyed my um, quality fireplace on YouTube. Uh, we use this a lot. Um, and actually, interestingly, there was an article in The Guardian in the last couple of weeks about how log burning stoves are really bad for um, air pollution, um, worse than transport, like cars and, and lorries and things. Um, so actually, maybe this is the stove of the future. <laughs> but we use, we use this a lot. Um, normally, it's got crackling in the background, but I didn't want that to interfere with the noise, uh, with the the audio um, but yeah thanks so much for joining me I really appreciate you taking the time to um, watch this um, as always if you could like and subscribe um, and maybe tell a friend I would love that um, we made it to over 100 subscribers so that's amazing so I now have my own unique URL so thanks so much to everybody who's subscribed um, and who's telling their pals uh, you're the more the merrier um, We'll be back next month, obviously, um, with more sewing and sustainability chat. Um, and in the meantime, you can catch me over on Instagram um, and obviously check out the shop over on Etsy. Bye. Uh, fucked already. <laughs> uh, blah, blah, blah.